Welcome to the kickoff of the second year of the Robert G. Hisaoka Speaker Series. Thank you all for coming tonight. We have a packed house. This is fantastic. Um, yeah, bravo. Go Terps. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Good. I'm Holly DeArmond. I'm the interim director of the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. This speaker series is made possible through a generous gift from Robert Hisaoka to the Dingman Center. And the purpose of this series is to bring business leaders and startup founders to campus where they can inspire students like yourselves and some alumni to explore business and entrepreneurship. Before launching this series last fall, we set our aim at featuring a variety of regional and national names in innovation and entrepreneurship. And our first speaker was Ted Leonsis, founder, chairman, majority owner, and CEO of Monumental Sports and Entertainment. In the winter, we featured a panel of young founders who shared their stories of launching their first ventures. And we closed out the series last year with Raul Fernandez, a proud Terp who is well known in the technology industry in the Washington DC area. Finally, I'd like to personally thank Bob Hisoka for this generous gift and for his continued support of the Dingman Center. I'd also like to thank the team responsible for executing this event and implementing Bob's vision. Jessica Davies, Donna White Sneed, and Megan McPherson. Now I'd like to introduce Alex Triantis, our Dean of the Robert H. Smith School of Business. Thank you, Holly, and it's a delight to be here with you all today, and uh, particularly it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Hiseoka, who is a very proud Smith alum. Uh, Bob has run and co-owned some of the largest automobile dealerships in the U.S. More generally, he is a true entrepreneur, board member, active angel and vet venture investor, and he's involved with many innovative and disruptive companies. Bob received the Smith School's Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2013. The same year, he was honored by Innova Health System with the Building Our Legacy in Cancer Award for his work with the Joan Hiseoka Make a Difference Gala to bring hope and healing to individuals faced with serious illness. This gala that Bob founded and organizes every year is but one example of his very active engagement in the community as a philanthropist wanting to make life better for individuals through investments in health, education, and sports. Just as a heads up, uh, Bob holds a fourth degree black belt in judo and has many national and international judo competitions, um, has, has won many national and international judo competitions, so um, I suggest you don't mess with him. Um, there's much more that I could say about Bob, but I am delighted to call him my friend, equally delighted that he has partnered with Smith uh, to create this speaker series. So please welcome Bob Hiseoka. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us tonight. And uh, Steve's ac impressive accomplishments in bio are too long to discuss given our time constraints. But I'll summarize by saying Steve is one of America's best known and most accomplished entrepreneur and phil philanthropist. He's a pioneer of making the internet part of our everyday life and a champion for entrepreneurship across the United States. Steve attended Oh, I'm sorry, Steve grew up in Hawaii and then left and attended Williams College in Massachusetts. And what was your college experience like? Pretty good. It was a, uh, Williams is a classic kind of liberal arts school, so I, I was able to get exposed to a lot of different, different things. And uh, on the side was kind of running some, some businesses, which not everybody on the campus was super enthusiastic about. I do remember one professor at one point pulled me aside and said, seems like you could do that the rest of your life. You probably should be focusing on what you could do on campus here, like in your classes and doing your homework now, which of, of course he was right, but I was still smitten with some of these, uh, these businesses. So, but it was a great experience. The weather wasn't so good. Coming from, from Hawaii, you know, when I first, uh, in October, I remember going to a class 
and it was warm-ish, like no, 60 degrees or something. I had shorts on and like flip-flops. And two hours later, I left the class, and it, it, temp temperature had dropped 40 degrees, and it started snowing. And I walked back to my dorm, and like three, four inches of snow. So I was like, ah, snow. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> but it was great. You also had some very famous uh, individuals that attended the same high school as you. Yeah, no, I was in uh, high school with President Obama. I was a senior when he was a, a freshman, so I didn't really, it was a big school, so I didn't really know him, played basketball with him, didn't, don't think I had any classes with him. Um, but it is a reminder, whether you're in high school or in college, you better be nice to everybody, because like, <laughs> he went on to like control the FBI and the IRS and you know, all kinds of things. Well, we have a lot of students in the audience. What's your best advice as far as maximizing their time here at the University of Maryland? I think it's a mix. Obviously, it depends on everybody and what, you know, kind of what their journey is, what their interests are. You know, kind of, yeah, but some of it is obviously taking advantage of the courses here and the professors here. A lot of it is building a network. You know, a lot, as I've learned over the years, it's, it's you know, the real key to success is people and, and relationships, so building that network and uh, over time that can help you in, in, uh, in lots of, of different ways. Uh, and really try to the extent you can, I know it's not easy, but develop a kind of theory of the case of how the world might change and what role maybe you can play in you know, kind of heading in that direction. That was certainly my experience uh, at, at college. I know I was lucky, but I, I remember I was a junior, senior, um, and this is 1978, 1979, I graduated in 1980, um, I just became fascinated with the idea of the internet, which of course we take for granted now, but back then it was really more of a, of a, a system that was restricted to government use and educational uh, institution use. It wasn't actually available uh, to consumers or businesses to, for another decade or so. Uh, but I remember reading about that, you know, different articles around video text and teletext, and this Minitel thing in France, and interactive this, and online that. And I also remember reading a, a book uh, which was not part of my courses. It was something I just learned about and read on my own uh, by Alvin Toffler, the futurist, called The, the Third Wave. Uh, and he wrote, this is now 40 years ago, about you know, how the agriculture revolution was followed by the industrial revolution. And he was predicting that would be followed by the technology revolution, the digital revolution, the, the internet revolution. I remember reading that and saying, I know he's right. And uh, I want to be part of that. Now, when I did graduate, uh, in 1980, uh, I, I couldn't go right into it because back then, frankly, there wasn't much of a startup culture. So the idea of starting my own company and raising money, which, which is more common these days, was not really a possibility uh, back then. And uh, there were no internet companies to go to because it was still, you know, at least from a consumer standpoint, still didn't, uh, didn't exist. Even, by the way, when we started uh, AOL in 1985, so what's that, 33 years ago? Only 3% of people were online, and they're online an average of one hour a week. So we said we wanted to get America online. That was really the goal. And it was still another five years, five or six years, after we started before the internet was commercialized. You know, some, you know, laws were passed by Congress. And up until then, until like 1991 or so, it was actually illegal for consumers or businesses to connect to the internet. So that journey from reading about it in the late 70s to you know, kind of slowly developing in the 80s and then finally really taking off in the, in the 90s was uh, you know, part of that journey. And one of the lessons I learned was sometimes revolutions happen in more evolutionary ways. Uh, and perseverance and passion matters. There were a lot of you know, folks in those early days that, that uh, gave up. And they said, well, I thought this was an interesting idea doesn't seem to be taken off. I should go do something else. But uh, you know, our team stuck with it. And uh, you know, finally, when things did take off, we had, I think, some influence in it, helping it take off, but also were well positioned to benefit when it you know, did take off. But that perseverance to stick with it uh, is, is important. And sometimes uh, entrepreneurs are a little too short term, a little too transactional, uh, and, and I think particularly in the innovation that's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years is going to require more, more perseverance. Well, we're going to go into America Online in just a moment, but I want to sort of finish up uh, this segment by saying that in regards to uh, 
leaving or graduating from Williams College, you then worked at Procter & Gamble for a couple years. And then after leaving Procter & Gamble, you went to work for a very beloved company with a great job title. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, so in 1980, when I graduated, I mentioned that I, I wanted to do the internet thing, but there, I couldn't find a path to do it. So I said, I, I gotta go do something else and learn some things in the process. Uh, so applied to, you know, to work at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, which was and still is a great marketing company, so I thought I'd learn a lot. There is a lesson there, though. When I applied and did an interview on campus, uh, they turned me down. They said, well, I'm not that interested in you. Um, but I really wanted to work for P&G. I, I decided that was the company I wanted to work for. So I wrote to them and appealed. So they give me another chance. This was like a bad day or bad interview. And they said, okay, this is like upstate Massachusetts. If you'll come to New York like next week, uh, we'll give you another interview. So I got on the Greyhound bus and you know shuffled down to, uh, to to New York. And the second time around, they they did offer me a job, which I think probably I was a little crisper in terms of why I wanted the job, but also I think I showed a certain you know hunger for it and passion for it uh, that I suspect also impressed them and, and and tipped it. So I did that for a couple of years, and then I moved to. Wichita, Kansas, to join what was then a division of PepsiCo, Pizza Hut, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with Pizza Hut. And at that point, uh, I, I had the what, what still to this day is the best job title I've ever had, which was I was the director of new pizza development. <laughs> that was me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No autographs, please. The, and so I basically, um, they actually paid me money to travel around the country and eat pizza. <laughs> and the idea inside, we had like these labs and you know, R&D labs and smart people in Wichita, Kansas, but one of the things I said was, I don't remember the exact date, but I think pizza had like 5,000 restaurants, but there was something like 50,000 independent you know, pizzerias and other kinds of things. I said, well, it's possible we in our you know, labs here in Wichita, Kansas might you know, come up with the next great thing. It seems more likely, the, probable that somebody, one of those 50,000 people somewhere has an interesting idea. So why don't we like go travel around and see what interesting ideas there are um, and then decide you know, which ones you know, might make sense to try to you know, put through the pizza system. So I literally was you know, spent about half the time traveling around and, and the ones I thought were interesting, uh, we actually then had a, uh, I was kind of like the advanced guy, we'd have a follow-up team of like chemists and engineers who would then go to the same places, buy it, and like reverse engineer it to figure out what it was and how they, they built it, uh, which seemed like a good idea. The only thing that I had not uh, you know, really fully thought through was there were great things in, in these different cities, but actually the core of the Pizza Hut model was having their chefs were essentially like 17 year olds who'd been working there for a week. Uh, so it's one thing to have, uh, you know, like a real chef make something. It's quite another thing to have 5,000 people that haven't really been trained that much, you know, to, to make it. So a lot of the things that seem like good ideas turned out to, you know, be, be not so easy to put through the, 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 the system. But that was a pretty good, pretty good job. If any of you are offered the opportunity to travel around the country and be paid to eat pizza, I would <laughs> encourage you to consider it. Well, you are the co-founder of AOL, driving worldwide adoption of the internet along with being the best performing stock of the 90s. And AOL was the first internet stock to go public in 92, I believe, with a market cap of $70 million. Eight short years later, it was worth $160 billion. Please tell us a little bit about this <laughs> once in a lifetime experience that you had. Well, like a lot of entrepreneurial journeys, it was, you know, it was, a little chaotic. It was not a, a, a straight line. So I mentioned the two jobs that I had uh, while I was trying to get in. Then I moved to the, the uh, DC area, to Tyson's Corner in 1983 to join a startup um, that promptly failed. I got there and like two months later, they laid off it was 70 people and suddenly it was, I think it was 15 people you know, left. And I, was, I went from one of seven or eight people in the marketing department to the only one left in the marketing department. I like to think because they thought I had potential. It was mostly, I think, because I was the lowest salary when they were looking at their spreadsheet of what to cut. 
Uh, and then, you know, that didn't work. It was a struggle. We ultimately, you know, couldn't figure out a way to, you know, kind of make that work. But thankfully, two of the people I met there, Jim Kimsey and Mark Seraph, and I co-founded America Online in 1985. Uh, and we raised, I think it was about a million dollars of venture capital to get going, uh, which by comparison, there was a big joint venture of IBM and Sears called Prodigy, and they had committed $1 billion to it. So it didn't seem like that was going to be a, a fair fight. So our strategy became how do you partner, particularly with personal computer manufacturers, and create essentially custom white label, private label, if you will, uh, services for them. So we worked with Commodore, which had the Commodore 64 at the time, very popular home computer, create something called Q-Link, and with Tandy, which owned the Radio Shack, which was a big PC you know, company at the time, create something called PC-Link, and then with IBM to create something called Promenade, and then with Apple to create something called Apple Inc. Personal Edition. So the first five years, that's sort of what we did. We, we didn't have the money to market ourselves, so we partnered with these folks to, to uh, you know, kind of figure out a way to you know, kind of let them take the lead on marketing and distribution. We'd take the lead on sort of the product and we'd kind of split the, split the profits. Um, that was actually working reasonably well. And then one you know, day we get a call from Apple and they say, we don't like this deal anymore. You know, they'd, they'd, I think never had licensed their Apple brand name to another company before. I believe they've never done it since. And they just realized that it was, from their standpoint, a mistake and they wanted to kind of pull out of this deal and go their own separate way, which was kind of a bummer because we thought that was going to be our big growth driver. Uh, but that forced us to kind of reassess things, and obviously because we couldn't use the Apple Inc. name anymore, forced us to you know, rename it. So that's what led to calling it America Online, and over time the, our customers, our, our members, our subscribers started calling it AOL. Um, and so in what looked like a crisis turned into an opportunity, as you mentioned, in public in 1992, well, we raised $10 million in our IPO, and the market value that day was $70 million, and nobody cared about this company going public. Like, well, we don't know what they're doing, but it doesn't seem important. Um, and the, the striking thing to me is, so in 1992, I, as I mentioned before, I started working on this, or thinking about this in like 1978, 79, so it's been almost 15 years. We had started the company in 85, so it had been seven years. Uh, and after all that thinking and all that work, we had like 184,000 subscribers. I think that was the name when, you know, the, the, when we, the, the number when we went public. Um, it was it was just not taken off. Uh, and then, you know, as you said, seven years later, instead of it being a couple hundred thousand, it was tens of millions, and the you know, growth in the company skyrocketed from dozens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and then the merger with Time Warner to tens of thousands of, of, of people. But it was, a, it was a struggle, and it took a while before finally, you know, we, we, uh, we broke through, which again is part of what I said at the beginning, part of my lesson in terms of perseverance was because of that experience. It was, it was what seems so obvious now, uh, and of course, you know, all of you, you know, with your smartphones, and your laptops or iPads or what have you couldn't live without the internet. Uh, for a decade, nobody really believed in the idea. Nobody really cared about what we're doing. And we just finally you know, convinced people it was a good idea. Finally, we were able to you know, get the price down. When we first started, it was, you know, the service is varied, but about $10 per hour to be connected. It's kind of a reason not to be online too long. And, the software was really hard to use, and the services if you actually got online. You know, there wasn't much to do, and there was nobody to talk to. It's kind of lonely, uh, and so it just took a while before it, it finally kind of, um, you know, took off. I should say, Mark Walsh in the front, and Polly, who I believe is on the Dingman board, was, was joined us in those pioneering, you know, years in the in the 80s and 90s, and could also attest to the fact that it was a a struggle. And so eventually, obviously, it, it, it worked. But um, yeah, even again, it's a lesson. Is if you are thinking about being on this entrepreneurial path, you know, you got to have some conviction in what you're doing because chances are it's gonna be hard. Chances are there'll be a bunch of times, including in our experience, where we almost hit the wall, almost didn't make it. Uh, a few times we had to do layoffs because we were kind of running out of money and you know, revenues weren't growing as as fast as we thought. But we we stuck with it and eventually broke through, but in some of those years, I would get calls from like my parents saying, 
we love you and all, but it doesn't seem to be working. You know, have you considered like a, do you have a plan B? It's like maybe time to get like a real job. And I said, well, I, I just think I think I think we're not. I think we're close. I think we're close. Um, and eventually, eventually broke through. Well, after successfully negotiating the largest business merger in history with Time Warner, you became the chairman and CEO of Revolution. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Revolution has two billion under management, so you don't do anything small, by the way. Uh, but under Revolution, you founded the Rise of the Rest. Please tell us about this initiative and what it means to you. Sure, I'll talk, I'll talk first briefly on the merger because it was not only the largest merger in history to this day, but has gone down as the worst merger in history. And so it's like, so what, you know, it's like kind of nice. So he's the guy who did the worst merger in history. I can only imagine like my tombstone, worst merger in history. Uh, and so what happened there? And so again, what are some of the you know, takeaways that might, it might be helpful to, to folks here? At the core, I mean, everybody has a different view of this, but at the core, the idea of the merger made a ton of sense, both strategically and financially. This is 19 years ago, before I'm bringing together the largest internet company at the time. We had about half of all the internet traffic in the United States with the largest media company that also was the largest owner of cable systems, which would give us a path to broadband, you know, and, you know Warner Music and Warner Brothers Studios and CNN and Time Inc. and, you know, all, all these different, HBO, all these different brands, like awesome you know, perfectly positioned for the future that was about to, uh, to unfold. Indeed, so perfectly positioned, every major company in the country, Microsoft, AT&T, Disney, marched on Washington to block the merger. They basically said, like, we can't compete with this. Uh, and this was before uh, Facebook or Netflix or Spotify or, you know, the, you know, the kind of things that, that there are, you know, kind of obviously big, big phenomena now. And this company had it within their their grasp. The reason it didn't work, you know, some timing issues and, 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 and so forth, but mostly it was about culture and people. That we had these two companies that never really united, indeed, on the Time Warner side. It was a company that was basically built through acquisition. You know, Warner Brothers at one point was separate, Turner Broadcasting was, was separate, uh, Time Inc. Was, was separate, et cetera, and they basically never really integrated and ran as one company, and so when we brought this thing together, it was basically everybody doing their own thing, and, and, and a lot of people on the Time Warner side, frankly, didn't really believe in the internet, and were really more focused on, the, on sort of the short term, not as much focused on the the long term, and some people on the AOL side didn't, weren't sufficiently respectful of, of the businesses and cultures and so forth. So it just became this culture clash, which was a, a difficult thing to, to, to watch, uh, but was an important lesson to learn. That it, and the lesson to me was it's, it's not so much about the idea, the strategy, the vision, it's more about the execution, and that is mostly about people. And that, you know, I've been asked about it, I said there's a Thomas Edison quote from 100 years ago, one of America's greatest inventors and entrepreneurs, which is that vision without execution is hallucination. The vision was there, execution was not there, and what could have been the first trillion dollar company and the first company to usher in all the digital services that you all take for granted stumbled because of people. Uh, part of the challenge down the street here uh, and, 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 and on the you know, Congress side is a similar thing. It's not, it's, it's, there are dis disagreements over policy. Some want to do this, some want to do that, but the biggest disconnect is actually over the lack of you know, compromise, the lack of, of trust, the lack of relationships. So I would just encourage you, irrespective of what you end up choosing to do, just to keep that in mind that it's, you know, it's more about the people you have. Entrepreneurship is a team sport and the people you partner with. Partnerships are going to become increasingly important. And, and saying, I have this wonderful idea is nice, but being able to execute it is way more important, and you can only do that with, uh, uh, you know, with people. Now I'll answer your, that's a long answer to a non-question, but I wanted to talk about it anyway. The specific question on, on, on Rise of the West, which we launched about five years ago, is we're really trying to level the playing field in terms of opportunity, level the playing field for for entrepreneurs, and here's the data. Here's why it's it's you know a problem. Last year, 75% of venture capital in this country went to three states. Maryland was not one of them. California, New York, Massachusetts, 75%. Maryland, 
less than 1%. Ohio, less than 1%. Michigan, less than 1%. California alone, 50%. So essentially, the entrepreneurs in California get, in terms of venture capital, every week what the entrepreneurs in some of these states, like Maryland or Michigan, get every year. As a result, there is a brain drain where people in those places often feel like they have to leave to go to the coast because that's where other people are and that's where you know the money is, which then saps these a lot of these you know, communities of, of, of talent uh, and creates this growing divide in, in the country. There's two other data points, though, that actually are even worse. Last year, over 90% of venture capital in this country went to men, less than 10% to women. Last year, less than 1% went to African Americans. So this is a great entrepreneurial nation. We should all be proud of it. Still, no China others are stepping up the game. I think still is the, the leader of the pack and the most innovative uh, entrepreneurial country in the world, I believe. But if you look at the data and are honest about it, it does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. It does matter who you know. Whether if you have an idea, you have the opportunity to turn that into a company, really the opportunity to you know, pursue the American dream. And that's not right, that's not fair, but it's also really dumb. Because if we're gonna continue to lead, we need to get everybody on the playing field. We need to have every idea, you know, kind of have a, have a, a shot. So that led us to launch this uh, Rise of the Rest initiative and we travel around the country so far by bus. Uh, so far we've visited 38 cities, 10,000 miles, and places like you know, Baltimore and Philadelphia and Buffalo and Phoenix and Albuquerque and you know, Salt Lake City and Madison and Minneapolis and you know, Atlanta, most recently Birmingham, Memphis, Louisville. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, each of these are, are cities that are showing momentum around the startup community but need more connectivity, more kind of collaboration, more network density, need to you know, kind of win this battle for talent. How do you slow the brain drain of people leaving and accelerate the boomerang of people returning? Uh, and, and, and needs to really create a little bit more of a fearless culture, a sense of possibility, uh, and it also needs to attract more capital. And so if we can do that, if we can help these cities rise and help the entrepreneurs in each of those cities rise, I, I do think it can help you know, level the playing field. I do think capital can flow more broadly. And if it doesn't, it's not just that we likely will lose this, what's now a global battle around you know, entrepreneurship. Uh, but I think this country will explode. You know, there's challenges now and different theories of why those are challenges, but a lot of that is rooted in opportunity. And there's a study that came out from Pew uh, not too long ago that said 75% of Americans are anxious about the future, fearful about the future, mostly because of technology. And they feel like this disruption we celebrate in Silicon Valley, it seems like it's bad for me. It seems like it's bad for my family, it seems like it's bad for my community, it seems like jobs are being you know, you know, destroyed. Um, and how do you give more people a reason to be optimistic? And startups are the big job creators, so if we back more startups in more places that are creating more jobs in more places, that is one way to kind of create more of that opportunity and create more of that, that hope and hopefully create a, a more you know, inclusive innovation economy. Well, changing subject for a moment, you're the author of a New York Times best-selling book, The Third Wave, An Entrepreneur's Vision of the Future. What drove you to write that book, and what is The Third Wave? Well, I'd resisted writing a book for many, many years. I wrote this a couple of years ago, and um, it was traveling around talking to people, and after a while I realized, hmm, there's some, some experiences I had uh, and some lessons I learned that might be helpful, but in particular I realized that there was this first wave of the internet, then the second wave, and the, you know, we're now entering into the third wave. And some of the lessons I learned in that first wave actually were not very applicable in the second wave, but I thought would be applicable again in the third wave. And so that led me to write it. Just to frame it, you know, is the first wave was getting everybody online. And you know, we talked about that, that earlier. The beginning of the first wave, call it the mid 80s. Nobody was connected. Nobody cared, nobody missed it, it was like completely irrelevant. By the end of that first wave, roughly the year 2000, everybody was connected and couldn't live without it. That was all building the networks and servers and on-ramps and educating people to get everybody online. Once that happened, 
that set the, you know, the kind of the stage for the second wave, which has been most of the last you know, 15, 20 years, which for the most part has just been about software and services built on top of the internet. Because the first wave, you didn't, you know, that the internet was built, you, you didn't need to worry about that. You just need to focus on your app, particularly on smartphones, and create something innovative that would get a lot of traction. And the third wave, which is emerging, it's, it sort of integrates the internet in much more, I think, seamless and pervasive, sometimes even invisible ways, and changes healthcare and education and smart cities and food and agriculture, some you know, big industries that are up for grabs. But the three key things we learned in the first wave, which I think are going to be important, one of them I talked about, which was perseverance. You know, the second wave, there actually were a lot of overnight successes. Facebook actually was an overnight success. Snapchat actually was an overnight success. Went from a dorm room startup to a global phenomenon essentially overnight. And the first way, there were no overnight successes. As I mentioned, it took us a decade before we really got, got going. Uh, and the third wave, some of these things like healthcare, it's actually really hard. I don't think it's about the app. It's about how do you have systems level change with doctors and nurses and hospital systems and health plans and, and regulatory you know, issues. It's going to be hard. It's going to require you know, perseverance. So you got to have that stick to itness. So the perseverance was a big deal in the first wave. Not that big a deal in the second wave. Big deal again, I think, in the third wave. The second, these are called P's, by the way, the three P's, just to, so I can remember them. The second is partners. I, mean, I mentioned some of this before. Those early days, we got started with a PC manufacturer. At our peak, we had, I think it was 300 partners. Media companies, commerce companies, you know, you know, all kinds of you know, software companies, hardware companies, communications companies. Together, we kind of stood up the, the internet. Uh, so partnerships were critical. AOL would never have succeeded without you know, partnerships. That was true with almost all those first wave internet companies. Second wave, you didn't really need partnerships. Mark Zuckerberg didn't need partners. People just embraced it and you know, told their friends about it, spread virally, and you know, voila, you know, it was suddenly a, a, a big ph phenomenon. Uh, in the third wave, because it's the systems issues, are, again, around healthcare and some of these other sectors, partnerships are going to be critical. It's not what any one company does or one, any entrepreneur does. It's how they kind of work together. So that was the second lesson. A big deal in the first wave, not that important in the second wave. Big deal again, I think, in the, in the third wave. And the final one is policy, regulatory issues. Huge in the first wave. When we got started, as I mentioned, it was illegal for consumers or the businesses to connect to the internet. Well, that's kind of a policy challenge you have to deal with. Uh, there, were, you know, the, 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 there was a judicial decision to break up Ma Bell, AT&T, the monopoly phone company, critical in terms of what happened, in terms of unleashing competition, lowering the prices of, uh, of communication. There are a whole bunch of policy issues that were front and center in the first wave, not that important in the second wave, until, at least until the companies got really, really big. Now, you know, Facebook and Google and others have some policy challenges, but it was not something that was critical in terms of their market entry strategy. It's going to be super critical in the third wave. You know, these are, and, and entrepreneurs don't like to hear this, particularly in Silicon Valley, because it's kind of this, a lot of people have like a libertarian, leave me alone kind of mentality. And we can debate what the regulations should be, and some of the regulations we have are kind of stupid. But there are going to be some regulations around medical device safety. There are going to be some regulations around how you know, driverless cars interoperate, particularly given some of the cybersecurity risks. There are going to be some regulations about you know, drones and you know, how they you know, fly. There are going to be some regulations around food safety. These are such important aspects of our lives. There are going to be some rules of the road. And the, the innovators who understand that I think are going to be an advantage. So those three, the perseverance, partners, policy, were the three, what I think were the key success criteria, the roadmap, if you will, for that first wave that, that was not necessary in the second wave, but is going to become important again in the, in, in the third wave. And you've seen entrepreneurs who don't understand some of the issues around you know, policy, for example, get in real trouble. You know, most visible recent example is com company Theranos, at one point was worth $9 billion, is now bankrupt, worth zero, mostly because of decisions they made on the, on the uh, policy front. Talking about policy, you're a leading voice in shaping government policy on issues related to entrepreneurship. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you do in that area? Yeah, no, I sort of stumbled into it uh, eight or nine years ago uh, because I was asked to co-chair an initiative called the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. 
uh, and then that led to a series of recommendations, including that the White House then President Obama launched an initiative called Startup America, which he asked me to chair, which also led to me being on his jobs council and working with some other folks to kind of craft policies that would be helpful to entrepreneurs and particularly helpful to the flow of capital. Um, and that came, a bunch of things came out of it. One of the things was the Jobs Act that passed five or six years ago. Um, and more recently, there was a le you know, the legislation as part of the tax reform that created this notion of opportunity zones, which create incentives to invest capital in some of the communities in our country that are most you know, disadvantaged. Uh, so those things were, were things that I said, I think I can be helpful here. I think I understand some of the issues. I think because I've lived here 30 years, I've tried to build relationships on both sides and be pretty independent, pretty, pretty bipartisan. So how can I be helpful? Uh, and trying to make sure we're doing everything we can as a country to continue to kind of remain as, as innovative as, as, as possible and deal with some of the policy issues that do require kind of bipartisan support to, you know, get people to, you know, come together. We had, you know, some successes, some, you know, some areas are, you know, been a, been a disappointment, immigration being a, uh, a great example. I think we are at risk of losing what is now a global battle for talent because we made it harder for people to come here and harder for people to stay here, and we need to address that. Hopefully, we will you know, soon. But you know, there there are there, there's still some work to be done to make sure that we are you know kind of, you know, kind of con are well positioned uh, or as well positioned as possible to continue to, to to lead as the most you know entrepreneurial nation. Uh, and I'm happy to spend time on on those issues because I think it's kind of important. I, I remind people here in the D.C. area uh, that America itself was a startup. It was just an idea. Like 250 years ago, it was just an idea. Almost didn't make it. Like a startup that almost hit the wall. It was pretty fragile. And now it's like the leader of the free world. Why? Because it has a leading economy in the world. Why? Because Entrepreneurs led the way here with that agriculture revolution, then the industrial revolution, then this technology revolution. That's why we went from this fragile, tiny, kind of irrelevant startup nation to kind of a leader of the of the pack. So how do we continue to lead in the in the future? And we've seen the day I think it was 20 years ago, 95% of venture capital is invested in the United States. Now it's less than 50%. That's actually good for a lot of these countries that are you know, getting the benefit of venture capital and the job creation and and you know particularly in the developing world, it's essential if we're going to you know, create opportunities and have stability in, in, in some of those uh, regions. But it does should be a reminder to all of us that it's kind of game on in terms of entrepreneurship and. A lot of countries around the world have kind of figured out that the secret sauce that made America America was this innovation entrepreneurship thing. And so whether it be immigration policy or you know, you know, incentives around you know, capital and investment or investments in basic research or a whole host of things, a lot of you know, folks are saying, okay, we better, we better step up our investments there. And that's not the time for the United States to step back and create a vacuum, which you know, I think there's a great risk uh, that 25 years from now or 50 years from now, we'll look back and say, what were we thinking? Uh, we've kind of ceded the territory. Time we should be doubling down on our entrepreneurs. We, we kind of backed away. How do you see the DC region being reshaped over the next 20 years? And what are the opportunities for entrepreneurs in this region? What's well, evolved a lot when we when we got started, as I said, 33 years ago, it was pretty much a government town. It was it was you know, lobbyists and law firms, and uh, there weren't a lot of startups. Um, and even when we raised that early venture capital I mentioned, none of it came from the D.C. area. We raised money from Boston, Toronto, Chicago, San Francisco, New York, zero from the, the D.C. area. So it's evolved a lot, and if you just See around this area, or in you know, DC, or drive to Dulles Airport, and you see all the you know the companies there. It, it, it's gotten uh, a lot better, but there's still work to do in terms of building some of the things I said before that you know, that you know kind of creative culture and you know, attracting and keeping talent and attracting you know, more capital and, and 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 so forth. I think it's super well positioned. I, I've said for a while. I, I have no idea where Amazon will end up picking their next headquarters. I guessing it will be in this region, you know, exactly how much of it is Maryland versus Virginia versus DC or some hybrid, you know, hard to say, but I, I think that that's, it seems like the logical place to be uh, for a whole, whole host of reasons. And I also think this region is particularly well positioned in this third wave 
because of some of the dynamics I mentioned, such as the, you know, the, the importance of policy. You, know, you kind of have a, if you're closer to where some of those decision makers are, that probably will uh, advantage you versus if you're, you're someplace else. So I think, you know, as you think about your, you know, career as the next move, obviously a lot of people will go in a lot of different, different directions, but I think staying here and planting a flag here uh, you know, will likely be a good bet because what's likely to happen, I think, over the next 10 or 20 years is, you know, D.C. to continue to rise as one of the, you know, kind of great startup you know, cities and the kinds of things that are going to be, I think, critical in this third wave play to the advantages of, of entrepreneurs here as opposed to entrepreneurs elsewhere. Over 20 years ago, you and your wife, Jean, founded the Case Foundation and joined the Giving Pledge, which was founded by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, uh, which basically says you'll donate over 50% of your net worth to philanthropic causes. What drove you to join the pledge, and what areas of focus do you have, and what does it mean to you? Well, the, when the pledge emerged, which was, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, maybe, um, initially we were uh, a little reluctant, because we'd done a lot of giving quietly. You know, we just had a bias towards, you know, kind of not tooting our horn, I guess, uh, and, and particularly the first you know, decade or so. We learned over time that, that sometimes, even if it's maybe not, if it's a lot outside of our comfort zone, it's actually helpful to the organizations we're back in care about to be more visible in terms of promoting them and, and encouraging other people to support them. So we've over time become a little bit more visible. But we started you know, with that kind of you know, bias. And when the giving pledge was announced, we said, well, I'm not sure that's, that's really for us a little too public. What changed that was we believed, and it's proven to be the case, that there is a value to networks and shared experiences and shared lessons. And, and it's not just a bunch of people with 150, 160 people or families now have committed to this, but they have frequent meetings several times a year where they come together and, and talk about what's working and most importantly what's not working. And so everybody's philanthropic efforts you know, can be a little smarter and have a little bit more impact than if they all were doing their own thing without that you know, connection. So that aspect was, was, we thought, really important. And we also thought there probably was some value, and I think it's been the case, to shine a spotlight on the importance of philanthropy, not just for the you know, wealthiest, but for everybody. And, and there are many communities in this, in this country where you know, philanthropy is, is front and center, and how do you kind of celebrate that? Uh, and, and so those were the, you know, the two reasons to it. In terms of what we've done, our, our strategy with the foundation, which my wife Jean has, has, has run and continues to run, is to pick new issues every five or so years. So it's a little bit like a venture capitalist where you invest in a company and take it a certain level and then kind of hand out the baton, sell it or take it public or something. Our mindset with the foundation has been similar. So we've done a number of different things. In the early years, we spent a lot of time that's so quite a lot of money in trying to bridge the digital divide and build technology centers. And we built over a thousand technology centers to give kids in neighborhoods that didn't have a PC, didn't have internet access. That you know that access. We did some work in, in Africa around clean water. We did some work and still still doing some around uh, cancer research. Most recently, the last you know, five years or so, a couple of big areas of focus around promoting impact investing. The idea that companies. Uh, can not just focus on profit, but also on purpose, and how that can evolve as really an asset class, and also a lot on this inclusive entrepreneurship. So it's linked with the, what we're doing with the Rise of the Rest, and uh, we launched an initiative a number of years ago at the foundation called Faces of Founders, to hashtag Faces of Founders, to try to promote a more diverse face of entrepreneurship. And the reason we did that is we uh, searched on Google famous U.S. entrepreneurs, and they're all white guys. We said, well. We do need to do a better job of backing more people in, from different backgrounds that look differently, but there actually are some successes out there. Why aren't their stories kind of like this the movie um, Hidden Figures? There are also hidden figures in the entrepreneurship world. How do we promote you know, the, you know, some of those, uh, you know, those successes? So inclusive entrepreneurship has been a, uh, a big focus there. And the, uh, the last one is an initiative that we launched a couple of years ago, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, uh, called Be Fearless, trying to encourage particularly you know, some of the social sector organizations to be a little more uh, focused on not the risks, but the opportunities, and not focus on what might go wrong, but focus on what might go right, and take, you know, take more shots. And uh, Jean 
has a book coming out in January called Be Fearless uh, to try to kind of move that initiative, you know, kind of uh, forward. Well, one final question before we finish up, which is a two-part question. One is, what's the best advice you have for our aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience? And two, are there any emerging trends in technology that you especially like? Yeah, on the first, it's always hard to generalize because everybody's different. Everybody has different, you know, desires. Some want to start something. Some want to join something that then be part of that, you know, that team. Some are more likely to be more comfortable being part of something kind of later in the in the in the in the journey of, of what companies becoming, you know, kind of big companies. So it's, it's pretty hard to uh, generalize, and it's also hard. I know if I say like, you should follow your passion. Because for a lot of people, it's like, well, I don't have a passion. I, 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 I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what that is. That leads me to say one of the things that's worked for me is, um, and it works for a lot of entrepreneurs. It, 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 the core entrepreneurs are willing to deal with tremendous degree of not just risk but also ambiguity, uh, and they're really good at pattern recognition. They're they're paying attention to a lot of things. And they're, as a result, seeing kind of some trend emerge, saying, hmm, seems like I'm reading more about that, hearing more about that. Seems like that kind of makes sense. Like my experience, you know, those early days of, of uh, thinking about the internet. And they say, well, I think that's where it's going. I'm going to try to position myself to be part of that, maybe be part of driving that. Uh, so paying attention to a lot of different things, you know, not just you know kind of narrowly focused on the area that you are particularly uh, skilled at, but having a broader aperture, a broader kind of uh, you, know, you know kind of uh, just perception of what's happening, and then trying to figure out ways to connect the dots in, in uh, interesting ways often can lead uh, to different opportunities. Second would be the importance of network, importance of people. So how do you connect to people in sectors that you care about, whether it be entrepreneurs here uh, in Maryland, or if you're really interested in like smart cities, or really interested in precision medicine, whatever it might be, how do you, you know, figure out ways to connect to people in that, either through conferences or you know, monitoring blogs, or just figuring out some way to track what's happening there and try to connect to other people who have a uh, a shared, uh, you know, passion there, uh, and then the, the, you know, the final one is to be fearless. You know, the, the, you know, most startups fail. It, it is risky, uh, but I'm reminded that the you know, Babe Ruth, the great baseball player, was was the home run king. He like hit more home runs than anybody else. That's that's like the headline. The subtext is he also was the strikeout king. He struck out more than anybody else. Because you're not going to hit a home run if you go up the plate and you bunt. It is not possible. So you have to go for it. And if you're going for it, you're going to strike out sometimes. It's just, that's just, it's just true. And so, you know, kind of trying to figure out, you know, kind of things you care about. I'd also would say, ideally, you find a, a topic, a, a sector, an industry, a, you know, whatever, that's uh, important. Like, Kind of like a mountain worth climbing. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure the world necessarily needs another restaurant ordering app or dating app or photo app, although those are all fine. But we do need to figure out better ways to think about healthcare and have more precise approaches to you know, dealing with diagnosing things and, and, and treating. I mean, we do need to figure out better ways to you know, teach our kids the things that machines can't do and create a uh, lifelong learning path because everybody, all of us, are going to constantly have to learn new skills, be, be reskilled. We do need to think about how to be smarter around how we manage large populations in cities, the whole idea of smart cities. We do need to figure out how to, you know, kind of reinvent, reimagine our food systems because most of the food we eat is not good for us. And how do you create a, you know, that, you know, healthcare part of the reason we have a healthcare problem is it's long been said that healthcare begins at the end of your fork. So, like, what you eat kind of matters. And so these actually are, and there are many other examples of this, real challenges. You know, but they also, if you look at it as an entrepreneur, are real opportunities. And so to the extent any of those or anything else, you know, kind of is something you're you're passionate about, granted it'll be hard, you know, granted it, it'll be risky, granted you might you might not work for you. Um, but at least 
kind of take a shot, you know, and trying to deal with a real problem that requires real innovative, you know, thinking and recognize the role of partnership and policy and perseverance, some of the things I, uh, you know, I, I said. And hopefully when um, Jeff Bezos said this, uh, we were together last week at something, I've heard him say this several times, he said that he's decided early on, this is why he decided to start Amazon, to try to live a life where he minimizes his regrets. The reason he did Amazon, even though his wife was like, eh, not so sure, and like he was, he was working for a hedge fund in New York, was very successful, and the guy running the hedge fund said, this seems like a, not such a great idea. Um, and back then, it was just pretty narrowly, like the selling books online thing, because he said, uh, I think this internet thing, just looking at the data and the growth of users um, is pretty interesting. Um, and if I don't do it, I, I think I'm going to always regret it, so I'm going to do it. And he tries to, even decisions he makes in his life, how do you kind of minimize the, those regrets? And you know, most people, I'm told, I'm hopefully not quite ready on you know, my deathbed, but uh, you know, most people will say when they're dying, as my understanding is, is, is they're generally bothered by the things they didn't do, the, the paths they didn't take, the opportunities they didn't you know, you know, see. It's, it's, you know, and, and so I would encourage you to kind of live a life like Jeff that, that is, you know, kind of where you take, take a little bit more risk and, and you try to minimize um, your, your regrets. I'm not saying you'll necessarily be the next Jeff Bezos or next, be the richest guy in the country, in the world now, I guess. Uh, but that mindset, I think, is, is helpful and healthy. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thank you for donating the books to the students tonight. Uh, we've enjoyed everything, and it's a pleasure to have you here in our honor. So thank, thank you, you very Bob. much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all. <laughs>